Thank you for joining us online today. Here at the House of the Lord, we love to hear what God is doing in your life. So if you have a testimony that you'd like to share with us, please email amen at hotl.church. If this house has impacted you anyway, and you'd like to partner with us financially, please visit our website, hotl.church, and click on the top right to give. Or you can text the dollar amount to 84321. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy the message. Have a great day. Hey, this is a, this is a great day, uh, and it's a great day because um, the Spirit of God is with us. Amen. Uh, We've we got a few of our, few of our uh, media team and worship team here to just give me somebody to, to talk to, but I realize that um, uh, we're, we're with you, and you guys are doing church at home, and I'm excited about it because we talk all the time about the church isn't the four walls. And now we get a chance to actually walk out that theology, amen? And so, you know, the, this is at 11 o'clock, so hopefully by now. I, I was thinking I need to dress down a little bit, maybe just kind of make everybody feel comfortable, but Robbie wouldn't let me wear my pajamas, you know? So, uh, you know, I just maybe doing church in your pajamas, you're comfortable with that. But um, first of all, oh, well, and second of all, uh, being a TV preacher was never in my bucket list, you know? So we're, 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 we're going to give it... We're going to give it a try. I, I want to just remind you too, probably in the announcements you caught this, but stay tuned to our uh, House of the Lord Facebook page um, as well as the YouTube page because we're going to be posting some important notices, encouragements, devotionals, different things. I've been doing that a little bit. Uh, this week, um, I, uh, I, I, I've done something that I've never done before, and that was I was invited uh, to be part of a podcast that Pastor Joel was doing called um, Faith Simplified. And see how I give you a plug for that podcast? Yep, it's, it's good. I, I really recommend you get on it. But anyway, one of the questions that Joel asked me was, what I thought believers should be doing, you know, what, 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 is, the, what is the posture? What is the, you know, what, what should we be doing as believers in this, you know, incredible time? And um, my first response was, don't, don't lose your voice. You know, was it really don't lose your voice. Um, we covered last week that we're the citizens of the kingdom, and we have rights and we have responsibilities. And um, our passport and our credentials are in Jesus. And I think that's really important for us to remember. And if you think about it, a citizen from another country, especially some countries, are not hard to recognize if once they talk. Like, for example, if you've been around somebody that's you know, really, truly a Canadian, then you can usually pick that up pretty quick, or, or, or maybe Ireland or, or uh, uh, Australia or something like that. So there's a certain particular sound that I think we need to be making as, as, as sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. We're, we're children uh, of God, and we're part of our citizenship is in heaven. And uh, it reminded me of the story in Mark, in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. It said, And on that day, when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and the other boats there with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and he rebuked the wind and, the, and said to the sea, he, he said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? You know, at first blush, I kind of thought, you know, maybe Jesus was a little irritated with him. But then recognizing that he's such a great leader and he's discipling these men, I really believe his approach was more like, why are you afraid and why do you have not faith? I mean, he was encouraging them. And they became, it says in verse 41, they become very much afraid and said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So we find out that Jesus was actually asleep during the storm. And he challenged them that they approached the situation with fear instead of faith. 
our, our, our response as believers should be, and I, I'd love to sit here and stand here and tell you that every difficult situation that I've faced, I've faced first with faith. I, I can't say that. Because our first reaction is usually anxiety and it's fear. But Jesus is trying to actually train, uh, train and teach the disciples that, listen, when you encounter something, here is your first response. And it's, and, it, and, and it's faith. And I get the idea that he was actually saying, where is your voice? Because he spoke to the wind and he spoke to the waves. And I, I really feel like he was really saying, why didn't you speak? You have the same authority. You, you have the same authority to speak. And in all fairness, it was later on in the book of John that Jesus told them, greater things you will do in my name. But I believe that Jesus was training them. And, and in this instant, he saw the reaction to the storm should not be fear but faith. So we also need to realize in, in the account of, of Matthew, this was the one in Mark, but there's another account in Matthew that Jesus actually walked on the very storm that they were afraid of. You know, it, the storms over your head are still under his feet. Can I just say that? The storms over your head are still under his feet, and God can calm whatever the enemy stirs up. God can calm that. I, I found this in, in Psalm 107, verse 29. He said, he stilled the storm, he being God. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves and the waves of the sea were, were hushed. And just, just being transparent, we don't, we don't want to be tone deaf. We want to be super sensitive to our culture. I was talking to, to one of our team members tonight, and she said something that really kind of moved my heart. And she said, you know, people are just so afraid. You know, you're just running into people that, that are in fear. You know, and my heart goes out to them, and hopefully our hearts as believers go out to them, and our hearts go out to you because this is a really time. There, there's not been one of us. There's not been a pastor in our nation. There's not been a, a, a husband or a father uh, in our nation. There's not been a family that's had to lead their family or community through a pandemic. I mean, this is, this is new territory. But can I, can I just say this? God has led his people through many pandemics and plagues and difficulties and trials. So this is not new to him. It's new to us. What we need to do is put our trust in him. And I'm going to talk about that. See, I want to, I want to just remind you the sound that we need to be making is the sound of faith. It makes a sound because it's not just a word. It's not just some sort of ethereal religious concept. It's actually a word. That, that has some action to it. So I want to jump back into our series in Philippians, and I think it's going to be timely, and it's going to be very uh, encouraging to us all. So in the first three verses of chapter 3, we're in Philippians 3, Paul is encouraging us to rejoice and to be aware of legalistic people. I'm not going to go through all of this because I want to kind of focus on this one passage that I felt like is really appropriate for our time. But first of all, just to give you an overview, he's talking about, he's saying to rejoice, and then he's saying at the same time to beware of legalistic people, because there's people coming in and, and trying to, you know, the law plus Jesus equals salvation, when we know that actually it's Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. It's the same old argument, the same old thing that was happening. See, there's always this pressure to try to approach God by what we can do right, and we have to recognize that it's so important uh, to, be, you know, to be in a relationship with God because of what we feel or what we, we feel like we need to do. And, and then, then Paul's actually reminding us that we're marked by God spiritually. You know, there's a circumcision that is spiritual. And he goes on, Paul goes on to give us his resume. I'm kind of going to bring this down to, to a place where I, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be super encouraging, but he goes on to give us his resume, he, that he was of the tribe of Benjamin, he was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews, he was a zealous, zealous follower of the law, etc. I'm going to read this, Philippians 4, 4 through 7. It says, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Can you feel it? I mean, he's just, he's putting it right out there. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. Have you ever been around somebody that's kind of like that? 
I mean, seriously, it's kind of like, okay, that's cool, man. You've made it. Because if we're not careful, we can kind of adopt a religious pride, a spiritual pride. And, and Paul is actually being super transparent with this. And he says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted for loss for the sake of Christ. He was actually saying they just don't matter. You know, see, the, the thing is he'd come to this realization that these things did not ensure or earn him salvation. See, we're kind of resume orientated in our culture. Think about this. We're resume oriented. Apply for a job and they want to know what you did in the past so they can measure the merit for the future, right? And you want to apply for a mortgage and they want to know what your past was to determine whether they will trust you in the future. So we're pretty, we're pretty uh, amazing with resume. So, uh, so Paul had this impeccable, uh, impeccable resume that actually didn't measure up. Not at all. No matter how hard he tried or how diligent he was, it not only did not measure up, but it wasn't needed because of Jesus. See, this is the cool thing. It would be like you or I showing up for a job and getting ready to fill out the resume, and Jesus steps in and says, here, I want you to look at mine instead. And so it's like when we approach eternity, okay, life after death, eternal life, we have a tendency to want to get our, well, I've been a good person, but I don't know about you, but I can't even measure up to what the apostle Paul was. I mean, a Hebrew of Hebrew, a Pharisee of Pharisee, zealous, righteous. I mean, you look at the guy. The guy had some serious, serious stuff. And yet he said, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. I needed Jesus. So as we we move into this, or or, or think about this. Have you ever been uh, to uh, a restaurant that they had a dress code? and they required a jacket, you show up, and they, I, I've actually had that happen. I know up here where we are in North Idaho, these guys think camo will get them into everything. But you, you, you show up, and they say, you don't have a jacket, you can't, you can't be at the table, you know? Uh, but Jesus said, if you put your faith in him, that that's all you need. God says it's not only acceptable, but not needed for you to try to figure all this stuff out as long as we put our trust in Jesus. Jesus has, has it if you put your faith in him, and we're going to talk about what that means. Uh, so I'm going to look at Philippians chapter 3 and verses 3 through 14. Hopefully you're following along. I, I really do feel like, I mean, I put my, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot easier for me. If I'm, if I'm reading all my scripture out of my Bible, I got to put my reading glasses on. So it's a lot easier for me to do this, but I really feel like it's important, you know, especially model something to our kids. You know, I mean, have the Bible and follow along. But Paul has this revelation. He says in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, with all the resume, he goes on to say, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which is God had called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So once again, he's reiterating, no one has arrived. And it's important that there's a, the mirror that you use in your car to back up is the smallest because you're not going to go forward by continually looking in the past. So now I'm going I'm, I'm to I'm go to verse 9 and I want to unpack verse 9. I think it really applies to what you and I are walking through what we're all walking through in, in these times. So Philippians 3, 9, it says, and to be found in him. Here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. And to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith. Come on, say it with me. Through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So we find in that passage of Scripture, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. And Paul is saying that the key to being found in him 
is faith. Okay. Do you remember the story we covered with the storm at sea where Jesus asked, why are you afraid and, and then where is your faith? So I want to unpack this word faith because it's the opposite of anxiety. And right now people are recognizing that they had maybe put their faith in their 401k or their IRA or their government or their whatever, and that has not stilled their anxiety. I appreciate, I was sharing this a little bit with our staff earlier, I appreciate our country, you know, our government basically kind of figuring out how to stimulate the economy and, you know, and, and you know, give money to people and it's like, hey, that's great, you know. But you know what? I've recognized that that actually hasn't lessened the fear because we've got to approach this thing from a spiritual plane as well. I think there's natural things that we do, practical things that we do, wise things that we do. But man, if we try to do all those without really uh, contending in this in a spiritual way, then we're not making the sound of the kingdom. We're, you know, it, 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 in, the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name would pray. And I'm hoping that this is a time where we're praying, man, pray together with our kids, with our family, in our homes, in our, you know, the, the small groups that, that maybe we're, we're gathering. But this is so important. Job uh, 31, 24 through 28, it says, if I have made gold my trust or called fine gold my confidence, if I have rejoiced because my wealth was abundant or because my hand had found much, if I had looked at the sun when it shone or the moon moving in splendor and my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, this would also be an iniquity be punished by the judges for I would have been false to God above. Wow. Faith and belief can come across as kind of an ethereal, ambiguous, religious word. Sometimes it's hard to to grasp. I spent a lot of time in prayer just trying to make sure that I was communicating clearly what I feel like God had put on my heart and, and what the scripture says here. And hopefully you're, you're praying for me to communicate well. But faith biblically defined is like taking trust, belief, and action all rolled up into one word. Right. You know, we, we have words in our English language that are one word, but you know that they mean different things. You know, I love my dog is, be, is different than I love my wife or I love my kids. We get that, right? If any of you don't get that, we will have a hotline for prayer after we get done with the service. Amen? Just PM us, okay? But sometimes we define faith as simply belief. And that can be reducing the term faith well below its overall meaning. We want things to be simple, but we have to understand there's a complexity sometimes when we look at these terms. See, because if, if we simplify it just down to believe, I mean, in the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. But we have to understand what the biblical definition of believe in, uh, believe is. And sometimes we we, we define it as simply belief in kind of a shallow way, but that definition doesn't necessarily anchor you in Christ uh, or in salvation because, for example, the Bible says in James 2.19 that the demons believed in him as well. Does that mean that they're saved? No, because there's something here we need to grab a hold of. See, in Ephesians, uh, it says in Ephesians 2.8, and this is like, Probably my favorite verse. So anytime I get a chance to preach on it, I'm just, oh, come on. You know? Sorry. I like that. You guys need to laugh a little bit, okay? I know you are. But it says this in Ephesians 2, 8, 4, by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So if we translate faith only as belief, then we see that you know, like I referred to earlier, then the demons would be saved as well because it says that they believe. So what, what I'm getting at is there are people that intellectually know about Jesus but don't follow him. There's no action. See, 
See, see faith and, and belief, there's something that we, it's, it, they're, they're separate, but they're inseparable. And so faith has belief as part of the definition, but it's really even more than that. And then you throw the word trust in. So uh, in, in the Webster's Dictionary, Define trust as assured reliance on the character, the ability, the strength, or the truth of someone or something. The second part would be one in which confidence is placed, placing my trust in you. Uh, and the third would be a dependence on something future or contingent leading to hope. Okay, so here's, here's trust, and, and yet you realize, okay, there's, a, there's kind of a bunch of different d- dynamics to trust. So encompassed in the, this is what I'm excited about because I think it's so important. And the complete definition of faith is also the understanding of fidelity or allegiance. Okay, now in the New Testament writer's mind, faith and belief was a transfer of allegiance. It's a lot deeper than just kind of throwing something out there. So like, for example, maybe in the past, you only drove Fords. You loved Fords. You trusted Fords. You named your kid after Fords. You know what I'm saying? But then Ford left you down. You know, it sounds like a country song. You know, my Ford let me down, right? Um, and, and, and now you're going to change your allegiance to Chevy or Dodge or something else, and you know, half the people in the crowd just checked out, turned off. No way. A combination of belief, allegiance, and fidelity, because I think of it in the terms of marriage. A person who is faithful in marriage, faithful in marriage, just doesn't believe that marriage is good. A, a person that is faithful in marriage is saying, I am pledging my allegiance and my fidelity. I, I'm going to be faithful. That means I'm, I'm pledging my, I'm, I'm shifting my allegiance and my fidelity. So like, for example, before um, Robbie and I met, my, my wife of uh, almost 40 years, um, you know, I had a, a, a couple girlfriends, you know, before that, and she had probably a hundred boyfriends or whatever. I don't know what it was. Anyway, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm a hear, trust me, I'm going to hear about it later. But when, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I committed to her in a covenant relationship, I actually shifted my allegiance to her totally. And in that, there's the expectation of fidelity, commitment. I, I, so so when, we, when we look at that, now when you read Ephesians 2.8, it takes on hopefully a little more clear meaning. This is emphasis mine. So, for by grace you've been saved by faith through the transfer of allegiance and fidelity. See? So, by grace you've been saved, uh, for by grace you've been saved by faith through the transfer of allegiance and fidelity. It means that I not only believe, but I've also exchanged my passport of citizenship from this world to the kingdom of God. And, and that is so important. And when we place our trust and our faith and our allegiance in God, there's this reciprocal thing that happens. Uh, my allegiance and fidelity, my faith that I have given to my wife, there are some things that she can expect. There's benefits. There's a reciprocal thing that comes from that. Um, I want to care for her. I, I want to shield her. I want to provide for her. There's something in me that just wants to protect her. Um, the, the other day, just yesterday, she actually tripped on the steps coming up into our kitchen. And she, she fell and, you know, kind of bonked her head on the, on, the, on the garbage, you know, thing right there. And I felt so bad for her. I just went over and picked her up and I would have exchanged places with her. I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't have wanted the embarrassment of tripping and falling and hit my head on the garbage can. But I wanted, I didn't want her because it's especially once I, I knew that she wasn't hurt, you know, I could kind of feel a little bit of the embarrassment. I wanted to take all of that on me because I'm in committed relationship to her. I didn't want her to have to go through that. So what's important about that is covenant relationships respond differently than any other relationship, if, if you get my drift. 
And, and placing our trust in Jesus, placing our faith in Him, brings expectations from both sides. There's expectations on, listen, when I place my trust, I shift my allegiance, I say, I believe, I walk into that place, then God actually gives me a new heart. And He gives me a new spirit. There's this amazing supernatural transaction that happens from heaven to earth. It's not just somebody that says, okay, the facts are undeniable. I guess I should follow Jesus and I got my fire insurance. It's more than that. There's this covenant relationship that happens that when the Bible says that, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear me and opens, I will come in. There's something that, you, you, back into that exhortation, in John, I believe it's chapter 19, it might be chapter 20, where the disciples are gathered in fear and Jesus actually comes through the door and he says, peace be with you. And he breathes his spirit into them. When, when, when I shift my allegiance and put my faith and my trust in Jesus, there's something that happens that's not just an intellectual exercise. Yeah. It's, it's an exchange yeah. of supernatural resources. And now I've got this exchange of supernatural resources that is actually with me at all times. But sometimes we're carrying around the gun and we don't realize that it's got bullets in it. You know, we got to recognize the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. I don't know about you, but now when I face difficulties, uncertainties, anxieties. I have to remind myself of that because my first thing is, oh, what are we going to do? Oh, wait a minute. Like we said last week, we have the Prince of Peace living in me, living in you. So actions on our part then, we see what God's done. Actions on our part, we respond. We respond by worship. We respond by obedience. We respond by giving. You know, one of the things you need to be really careful about in times like this, you have a tendency to go, oh, I better self-preserve. I better be selfish. I better. Listen, I'm telling you what, there's never a better time to give because you're actually, you're actually operating not as a citizen of the world, but you're actually operating as a citizen of heaven when you walk in worship. A lot of times people, it's easy to worship when things are going well. Man, I think things are good. It's harder to worship when you say, this is how I fight my battle. And, I, and I've got, this is who I'm called to be. This changes things. And in times like these, there's no better time to reexamine the faith and the commitment that we have in him. Paul was talking to, writing this letter to the church in Philippi. He was in prison. He was actually on the way, the result of this, would he, he would be executed. And yet he was talking about rejoice always. And he talked about being in Christ, in him. How do you do that? By faith. And to recognize the commitment that the Lord has to each of us in that relationship. I love this because there's a benefit to being found in him through faith. I'm just going to kind of open this up a little bit. Uh, Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 10. Proverbs 3, 5 through 10. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I love this. In all your ways, acknowledge him. So this is, Scripture is telling us, this is our actions, this is our response. And then it says, and he will make your path straight. Oh, wow, there's, that's a reciprocal thing. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And God's response, He will make your path straight. Yeah. How many of you need some straight paths right now? You need to know where to go. You need to know, okay, this is how I'm going to walk. This is how I'm going to talk. This is how I'm going to carry myself. I'm getting in a situation where this is uncharted territory. I need to know how to walk. And the Bible gives us the recipe for it. And verse 7 it says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. 
And then verse 8 says, it will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Wow, is that, that's how that relationship works, huh? I mean, that's how it kind of works up and down, right? In all your ways, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil and it will be healing to your body. There are people right now that you need healing in your body. You need healing in your, in your mind. You need uh, healing in your body. You might, you, you, we, need, we need the Lord to work in our finances. I believe that this is, reminds us of the benefits. In, in Psalm 103, I love this. It says, bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. Uh, bless the Lord and, and forget none of his benefits. Who forgives all my iniquities and heals all my diseases who redeems me from the pit. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? Who crowns me with everlasting compassion and mercy, who actually satisfies me with good things so that my youth is renewed. I mean, this is, these are the benefits. I mean, I'm not saying that the only reason that you give your life to the Lord and get in is because, you know, he's the candy man. But I'm telling you what, we have to recognize in this relationship that there are things we can cling to, where are things we can trust him for. Because God's relationship is not one-sided. God's relationship is reciprocal. Oh, then it says in verse 9, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. Okay, that's what the Bible's telling me to do. And then the response is, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And God doesn't say that just when times are good. He says that at all times. This is how we carry ourselves. So Paul writes in Philippians 3 about knowing him and the power of his resurrection. And I want to bring this down to a close now. We're, uh, I'm not sure uh, that you know, we want you to you know, have to be in your home church for an hour and a half. So we're going to try to cut it down a little bit low, a uh, little bit, a little bit shorter anyway. But I want to, I want to, um, I want to just kind of read this to you uh, because the, the same Paul writes in Ephesians chapter one, what he's been praying for people. This is really powerful. Okay. So we know we're studying in Philippians. We're in chapter three. And now we're finding that Paul has actually been writing. He wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus. And I want to declare over us, and I want to pray over us the same thing today that the apostle did over 2,000 years ago. So I go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 20. He says this, For this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, now, here, here, here's, where, here's where it comes together. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. So here's where we find that Paul has actually written down what he's praying for the church in Ephesus. And I think it's so powerful for us today that I, I want this to be our prayer. I, I, I want to read this over you. I want to read this over you and have you receive it. He says this, that the Lord, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. How many of you would say, I need that? And that's what he's praying. So he says that the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts be enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Wow, that's amazing. We have an inheritance. I mean, it actually says a glorious inheritance. And what is the immeasurable, this, come on, you got to get this, you got to receive this. This will help you, this will encourage you. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? Yeah. Oh man, can you, can you just feel that? Can you just feel that? What is it? I mean, let me read that again. 
What is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe? Believe, trust, faith. Amen? That's so powerful, man. I could just like stay there. According to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. So, as we're walking through this as a nation, as a, in our world, but especially the body of Jesus believers, the followers, people in the way, we've got to recognize that we are in this relationship. It is amazing. It's reciprocal. We can trust Him. We can call on His name. And I think it's important for people to grasp. And I'd encourage you this morning to be found in Him by faith. To be found in Him by faith. And if you're watching today and you've never taken a step of faith to believe, and remember that's transferring, believing and transferring your allegiance to Jesus, I would invite you to do that now. There's never been a better time. And if you do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray with this. And if you do, I'd encourage you to respond by maybe sending us a PM, personal message online so we can get some resources to you and walk in your journey. And if you're feel f- fearful this morning, I want you to remember that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So if you would just join me in prayer and b- bow your heads and your hearts. Uh, Jesus, first of all, I want to pray that everyone hearing that you would just breathe just a spirit of peace into our families, into our, into our, into our lives, into our kids, into our marriages, God into, I mean, just Jesus, you can come in and you can just breathe. And I pray Lord that it just, it, it just settles something within us. And I also pray Father, for anyone listening that hasn't made that step of allegiance, that step of faith, that transfer of allegiance and fidelity. I'm praying, Lord, this hasn't been really complicated, but your word says this, that if we believe, and and I'm not talking about that little shallow knowing, but if we believe that, that Jesus, you're the son of God, and that you died and were raised up on the third day, and we confess and profess that you're Lord and Savior. That's that step unto salvation. And I would just like you to join me and maybe in your own homes and pray this. We all pray together. Lord Jesus, I know I need a Savior. I know that you are the Son of God, that you died for my sin, and you were raised up again. And today I take that step of faith to believe. I transfer my allegiance to the kingdom of God. And the Bible says that I'm saved and I receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we just give the Lord an amen wherever you're at this morning? Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask Pastor Joel to come up and uh, just kind of... Just encourage us this morning or t- today as we uh, as we close our, our service. Get that out of your way. And a couple things that um, I really felt uh, strongly come, coming into this uh, this season that uh, the Lord put on my heart. The first thing I just want to I want to encourage us at home: don't waste this window. Hold on, um, you know. I know that I know that there's a lot of obstacles that, are, that, that people are facing right now, um, but but I also I also want to give you just a little bit of a of maybe a different perspective. You know, there's probably been no other time in your life, no matter how young or old you are, in which so many things have been simultaneously stopped. Every idol of you know of, of entertainment, industry, sports, all of these kinds of things that we we tend to fill up our lives with have been halted. You, look, i, I got to tell somebody, you have never had a better opportunity to make Jesus the center of your life than you do right now. 
I want to encourage you. I know that I know that some of some of what we're seeing in you know in, in, in our culture and in the future might actually look really scary, but I want to encourage you that instead of looking at this as an obstacle, we see this as an opportunity. Amen. Amen. And then uh, you know, as as I was in the drum cage, I really felt the Lord uh, put strongly on my heart Psalm 34. And can we do something wherever you're at? Would you stand with me? I, I'm gonna. I really felt that the Lord wanted to. Uh, wanted us to, to actually not just hear this over ourselves, but speak it over ourselves. You know, Psalm 34, if, if you don't know the context of it, uh, this is the Psalm of David in which he, you know, he, he starts it off by saying, I'll bless the Lord at all times. You know, and sometimes you read through Psalm 34 and you think to yourself, wow, that just sounds amazing. You know, God's a rescuer and God is this and God is that. You know when he wrote that? It was when he was running for his life from Abimelech. Yep. It was in his Amen. worst day that he wrote his best song. He stood oh, on the promises of God even when he was running. That's I love good. this because he began to declare the deliverance of God before he saw the deliverance mm. of God. And, and I feel as, as, I was, as I was coming out of the cage, I felt like the Lord said, I want my people mm. to declare that the angel of the Lord encamps around those Amen. who fear him. So can we do this? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, read this and, and I want you to repeat after me, okay? I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. I sought the Lord and he answered me. And he delivered me from all my fears. And he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Those who look to him are radiant. And their faces will never be ashamed. And their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried. This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Come on, the angel of the Lord encamps Ooh. around those who fear him. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear and him. And he delivers them. And he delivers them. Oh, taste and see oh, that the Lord is good. See. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Come on, let's pray, church. Mm. God, we thank you. We thank you that right now, Wherever this church is meeting, wherever they're, wherever they're hearing this, wherever, wherever we're viewing this from, you are right there in the room with us. Your word says that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. God, thank you that the peace of God, wherever you go, Heavenly Father, whenever you step into the room, the peace of God comes with you because you can't separate peace from God because God is peace. Wow. And so yes, God, we, yes, we declare yes. right now, peace that surpasses all understanding would rest upon every house in this season. Lord, we thank you that you didn't cause this, but you're gonna use it. Yeah. God, we thank you that the angel of the Lord encamps around the fear him. The Lord is good. good. Amen. We thank you, Jesus. We love you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We just bless you. Have an amazing day. Uh, just connect with us. Make sure, you know, just send us a PM or something like that. And we, we want to stay connected. Be connected to one another. It's important. Anyway, God bless you and thank you.